Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and to all those who are listening in now or later online. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we are so grateful for your love. We are so grateful for your holiness, for your justice, for your righteousness, for your everlasting mercy. We thank you for your kindness toward us, toward all who believe in giving us the gift of repentance and salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus, we are so grateful and thankful for you, for your incarnation, for the crucifixion, that you died to make atonement for our sin and for the resurrection. We thank you, Jesus, that you are ascended, seated on high, the right hand of God and over his kingdom. Thank you. Father in Jesus, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Spirit, we thank you. We rejoice that you have taken up your abode in us. Like a temple, we thank you. Father, make us living sacrifices that are pleasing in your sight holy and acceptable to you. Do in each and every one of us a work that you would have for us. In whatever way that we need to be worked upon this morning. Lord Jesus, we also then pray for my words that they might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight and useful and edifying and upbuilding for the congregation. In the strong and precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In a movie based on a, the life of someone who, which led to the writing of a real book. Okay, so the movie is about someone's life and his writing of a book named The Case for Christ. And this book is uh, written by Lee Strobel. The central character depicting Lee Strobel asks the person depicting a famous apologist, whose name is William Lane Craig, and he said, if you wanted to undermine Christianity, where would you begin? And Craig answers, the resurrection. Disprove the resurrection and everything falls apart. This is a biblically faithful answer, one that is the central point of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19, which will be our focus passage for today. Have you ever taken the time to think about the gigantic ramifications of the resurrection and the gigantic ramifications if there is no resurrection. Paul did, and so today we will as well. And by the end of the sermon, I want you to comprehend the vast importance of the resurrection and what resurrection means for us in daily life. So let's begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. We'll be summarizing. If we recall, we actually had a sermon on this at Easter time this year. We skipped ahead in our 1 Corinthians sermon series, worked through verses 1 through 11. That sermon is available on YouTube if you want the verse by verse. Let's simply hit a highlight or two along the way. First, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. And then also in verse 2, to hold fast to the word I preach to you. The word that is used there, what is preached, the gospel, is the good news that Paul will articulate in verses 3 through 11. It's primarily about the cross and the resurrection. 
Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day. In historical time, he physically fully died and he physically rose again in a supernatural, physical, resurrected body, which is immortal, incorruptible, imperishable, and he will live for eternity in that resurrected body. This is something that happened in accordance with the scriptures. Verse 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This is not something that is unexpected, although it was unexpected. This was something that was foretold. And although here a specific passage might come to mind, which is Isaiah chapter 53 on the suffering servant, what Paul is saying, though, is that it's not just one particular scripture, but it is the summation and completion of everything in the Old Testament. Verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, again, in accordance with the scriptures. And we need to tackle something here that is very important and something that I just want to emphasize, that Christ fully died on the cross. All right? He did not enter into a coma. He didn't simply go into some sort of dreamful state. No, he physically died. This is actually an old heresy that has re-come up in modern-day America, especially among biblical scholars, that we need to be aware of and we need to make sure that we understand. Do not be deceived. He died fully and he rose again. He was not just in a coma and then woke up three days later. That's false. He died and he was raised this gospel, and then Paul is basically going to elaborate on that in verses 6 through 11, especially the resurrection, right? Again, if you want the verse by verse, please look up the sermon on YouTube. But the, the rest of it is simply a reinforcing that, yes, Jesus was raised from the dead. And I want to um, hit on something here, and that is that this gospel... That Jesus died and rose again is the common ground for all genuine Christians. It's this word that brings all Christians together. It's this word, it's this gospel from which all other major doctrines flow. The doctrine of salvation, of regeneration, of sanctification of future judgment, of present ethics. All of this flows from the cross and from the resurrection. And without which, the resurrection that is, without the resurrection, our faith becomes vain. And that's part of what Paul will say moving on. So let's then begin our in-depth word verse by verse here in verse 12. The issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 12 is that there are some Corinthians who believed that Jesus died and rose again in time, but did not believe in a future resurrection. They thought that our, maybe our souls would simply go to God and we would live in some exalted spiritual condition or state, but that there would be no resurrection of the body. And Paul is going to go about tackling that, but then also tackling many things that are of concern for us today. He says this in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Here's how the argument works. Number one, if Christ is raised from the dead, then... All other people will also be raised from the dead. 
And if no one in the future will be raised from the dead, then Christ could not have been raised from the dead. Now you might be saying, wait a second, there seems to be a piece of that argument that's missing. How does Paul actually make those correlations? And why does it have to go in that order? Why do those pieces have to be connected? Well, the argument is actually hinged on the critical and important role of Christ as the first fruit, as the new Adam, or as the second Adam in the human race. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. It's in the book of Romans and in this letter of Romans in which we get the, this theology very succinctly, succinctly told to us. And so I want to spend some time simply reading Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. And it reads like this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So here's the argument. The first Adam, Paul is saying, look, the beginning of the human race, in the first Adam, there was sin. Through that Adam, sin spread to all. But not only that, because Adam's punishment was death, death spreads to all human beings. There's the necessary correlation. What affects one, the founder, the beginner of the human race, what affects Adam, then affects everyone else in the human race. Hold on to that main point because it's going to be important for 1 Corinthians 15. Let's continue on in Romans chapter 5, verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. That type is also really important for our 1 Corinthians 15 argument. What it means is that Adam... Just as Adam was, so he patterns something else that will happen in the future. Okay, grab a hold of those two main points. Let's continue on. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the argument in Romans so we're clear. Then we'll draw it all back to 1 Corinthians 15. Through Adam, Adam sinned, so too all men sin. Just as death was the punishment to Adam, so too the punishment was to all in the human race. Now, pay attention, because Paul's going to do something a little different in Corinthians than he does in Romans. But here's what he says in Romans. Jesus is something new. He is the new Adam. And when he died on the cross and rose again in the resurrection, for those who believe in him, through him comes grace and righteousness to those who believe. And you see that pattern. Adam... Here is the consequences through Jesus, the one man. Here, too, all the consequences. All right. Now, that's a whole sermon series for another day. That's in the book of Romans. Just hit on and grab hold of that concept. Through Adam, this affects the whole human race. Through Jesus, this affects all who believe in his name. That's from Romans. Now, turn with me back to 1 Corinthians, and we'll see what Paul is doing. 1 Corinthians 15, with this logic about 
Christ being proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Here's the argument. Since Christ was raised from the dead, so too all human beings will be raised from the dead. Just as what affects Jesus Christ, the Son of God, so too it will affect everyone else. Which is why he can say in verse 13, if there is no future resurrection of the dead, neither was Christ raised. Why? Because what happened to Christ will happen to all human beings. Now you might say, wait a second, uh, Matt, that seems a little dangerous. It, it, what are you talking about? Well, let's define some terms. First, salvation, salvation, I'm going to put it, I'm just talking about the resurrection. Salvation is the resurrection of the just, the righteous, who believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. And they will spend all eternity with God. The resurrection of the just. That's salvation. What's damnation? Damnation is the resurrection of the wicked. For punishment in eternity in hell. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. How does the dead stand? Have you ever seen a corpse stand? No. Corpses can't stand. This is talking about resurrection. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's hell. That's the great white throne judgment. Okay? Now, turn with me back to 1 Corinthians 15. And what we see here is this principle. Paul says, because Christ was raised from the dead, all human beings will be raised from the dead. And what we then know from the rest of Scripture is that there is a resurrection of the just unto eternal life. Those who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the resurrection of the wicked unto eternal damnation in hell. And the question for us today as we apply that practically. As are we living in light of the resurrection is this. Are we living in such a way that in word and deed we are proclaiming the gospel to others that they might be saved? Folks, if we do not have a strong theology and a strong knowledge of the resurrection, if we don't believe it here, it's going to come out in our practical everyday lives because we're going to say, well, what does it matter? I can always tell them the next time. I'll have another encounter with them, surely. I don't need to spread the gospel this time. Well, it's okay if I don't act appropriately now because surely they'll have a, com a conversation with another Christian at another time. Are we fighting in prayer? Are we begging and pleading with the Lord to give the lost the gift of repentance? 
I almost said it's a practical application I didn't even think about until this morning as I was sitting in Sunday school. Don't ask why, why this came to me. But the thought came to me, what we really need to do is have a dedicated prayer list in the congregation where we can write down the names of everyone we know who does not believe in Jesus Christ. So and distribute that list so that we can pray for them as a body until they come unto saving faith. Folks, how many of us have loved ones and lost ones who are going to be in hell because they do not believe in Jesus Christ? A recent survey from um, Pew Research Center says and has a prediction that in America by 2045, Christianity will be the minority religion and that the nuns group does anyone know what the nuns are? The nuns, N-O-N-E-S, meaning literally zero, nuns, means that they don't have any religious affiliation and barely any religious convictions. The nuns group in America will be bigger than the Christian group by 2045. Folks, we have work to do. And eternity is on the line. I want to say that one more time. Maybe we all need to hear ourselves say it. So let's all say it together because we need to understand how serious this is. Let's all say it together. Eternity is on the line. Eternity is on the line. This is not just about somebody going to church or not going to church. It's about so much more than present ethics, although present ethics is important. This is about life. That's the first part of what Paul is speaking and addressing and speaking to us 2,000 years later through this letter. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 and on. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. The word vain there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 means unfounded, void, meaningless, empty. I would almost add worthless to that. It means nothing. There is no point to our faith or in our faith without the resurrection. One more time. There is no point to our faith without the resurrection. There is nothing. Especially for us Gentile Christians. For Jewish Christians, they could go back to the law of Moses. For us, we go into nothing. I want to pause here for another practical application. I simply want to say this. In our day and age, in our world today, what we see is because there is no belief in the resurrection, life has become utterly meaningless and purposeless for those who are alive. It's become hopeless. Anyone wonder why, why there seems to be job signs up everywhere that you look? And no one wants to do any work and fill those positions? Now, there's a whole lot of complexity to this situation, but I'm just going to address it theologically and say this. It's because they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe there's an eternity. There is nothing. So why not get my fill of pleasure here and now? Why not live off the government? Who cares? Why not live in a shamble down house as long as I'm getting my pleasures? Who cares? Why work? What does it mean? There is no point. And our, and our generation, and specifically my generation and younger generations, have finally grabbed a hold of this and gone, it doesn't matter what we do. Who cares how we act? What's the point? There is none. Unless what? Unless there is resurrection. Unless there is eternity. It doesn't matter. 
Nothing matters. It doesn't matter if we live. It doesn't matter if we die. It doesn't matter how I die. It doesn't matter how I live. Why? There's just nothing. This is the rational and national, and this is the rational and natural path and end way of atheism. And our faith instead says everything matters. Why? Because of resurrection. Not only this, but in verse 14, the preaching of the apostles and the preacher and teacher of every time is absolutely in vain. And your faith is in vain if Christ has not been raised. Not only that, but for people like me, there is a greater punishment in store if Christ was not raised. Why? We are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. Right? Without resurrection, everyone who takes up the name of Jesus and proclaims his gospel has a greater punishment in store. Why? They're misrepresenting God. We have people... Well, let me, let me go on to verse 16, and then we'll talk here. For if, the Christ, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And we just need to emphasize that because Paul emphasizes it again. Now, here's the thing I also want to address as a practical application at this moment in time, and it's this. Look, Sometimes we have people fleeing the church or avoiding church. And we hear it, especially in my generation, people will go, well, I, was, I was just hurt in church, or I was, uh, somebody said something nasty to me, or I don't like this or that, or the pews are uncomfortable. And the list of stuff just goes on. You know, the sermons are boring. There's not enough stories. There's too many stories. And on and on the adage goes so that people can avoid going to church. Well, here's the thing. The real key is not about any amount of hurt or pain that somebody may experience in church. The real and central issue is simply this. Was Christ raised or not? And if he was raised, then we need to belong to the body and we need to go to church. A church anywhere. We need to go to a faithful gospel proclaiming church. If Christ was not raised... And it doesn't matter anyway. Those are the issues. And so when we, when we have people and when, when, we, when we hear these, all these different things and all these different excuses uh, of not going to church, what we need to bring it back down to the, is this, this basic issue, was Christ raised from the dead or not? And Paul's saying, Christ, of course, is raised from the dead. Therefore, everything we do matters. Take a look here in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The word futile means weak. It's unable to fulfill the task it was meant for. Right? Think about it in that terms. It's unable to fulfill the task it was meant for. In the words of Anthony Thistleton, a commentator on 1 Corinthians, he says, futile means fruitless. Pointless. Faith doesn't do anything if Christ was not raised from the dead. But then he goes on to this, and this, this point is, is a dual fold point. He says, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, basically he reworks it. That means the cross didn't do anything. Which means we are still in our sins. And that means two things. Number one, we still carry the burt and burden and weight of, uh, of sin upon our backs. All the things that we have done. And if we are in sin, it means that we are still in the old creation. We are still in the old self. Which means that sin still dominates our affairs. If Christ is not raised, then there's nothing that we can do to enter into a Christ-like, virtuous life. 
Because instead of being in Christ, if Christ was not raised, then we're still in our sins. Now, I want to put that in a, because Paul is, Paul is making a, a, a powerful and poignant argument for the resurrection, but we also need to take this and we need to think about it and we need to spin it for our current context so that we can see all sides. Let's take this positively. If Christ is raised, that means the cross had its full effect. It means that atonement was made for us on the cross, that we might be washed clean of our sins, that we might be fully forgiven, and that we are now in Christ. We are now new creations. We are no longer dominated by sin. Instead, we are filled with the Spirit and the power to live for Him. Do you see how that works? You can do the negative, then that's what Paul does, but the implicit, implicitly implied is the positive. And so we need to enter into it. One of the things that, that's just going through my mind all the time these days is this. Would I rather have this sin, or would I rather have eternity with God? And those are the options. And if we're saying, I'd rather have eternity with God, then we do everything in our power to put to death sin in our lives. And primary way of doing that is spending more and more time with God that he can destroy the sin still lingering in our members. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Present your body as an instrument for righteousness. Paul would proclaim in Romans. Verse 18. Not only do we have the disastrous consequences if Christ has not been raised, that our faith is futile, that we're still in sins, but notice this, verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. What this means is that there is absolutely no hope and zero hope of ever seeing them again. If Christ is not raised, then all those dead are truly lost. Verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all are of all people most to be pitied. Now, that verse is obviously meant to be in context. And what he clearly means in this is, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, then Christians are, are the most pitiable people on earth. It's all about the, it's all about the cross and resurrection. That's what everything hinges on. And you might be sitting and thinking to yourself, well, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, at least I would have lived a good life. No. There is none good, no, not one, apart from Jesus Christ, who is good. Not one. Everything is tainted with sin, unless Christ cleanses that person, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, they live. Why is this important? Again, in light of the resurrection, we have to stop thinking that people are good by nature. They're not. What a good person they are. I would just be ashamed to tell them the gospel and tell them that they're living in wretched sin and that they're a pitiable and poor sinner. I mean, look how upstanding a person they are. What a shame. They're not. They're sinners in need of a Savior. We always need to come back to this. This is the gospel. We are wretched and in sin, and Christ was born and died for us on the cross that we might obtain forgiveness of sin by faith in him. And he has paved the way through the unconquerable enemy, death, and risen to new life that all who believe in him may have eternal, everlasting life. 
Only in Christ, him crucified and raised, do we have hope. And what a rock solid and sure hope it is for us today. A hope for cleansing and a rock solid hope for the future. So in conclusion, what I want to share with you is some positive notes because we've been over the negative argument. I want to flip again to the positive. Number one, live in joy and hope because Christ is risen. Number two, proclaim the resurrection and plead before God for lost sinners that they may be saved. And three, live every moment of your life in light of the resurrection. N.T. Wright tells the following story about being in a taxi ride from one place to another. And he's in the conversation with the taxi driver. And the taxi driver ends up saying, well, if Jesus Christ is resurrected, then everything else is just rock and roll, ain't it? Yes, indeed. If Christ is risen from the dead, then we live in complete hope complete joy and dwell in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ, pursuing holiness and true goodness defined in scripture and working for God's kingdom to come. We pronounce, proclaim, argue, reason, and give the gospel to others. We plead with God to save them. We plead with others to be saved. Living in light of the resurrection means that we take seriously the consequences of the resurrection, which is judgment. The coming judgment impacts how we live today, both with our gospel proclamation and with our very lives. We live today because we wish to please and serve the master who is coming and whom we will serve forever. Do you truly comprehend the great importance of the resurrection and its implication for our lives today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for you, for your goodness and for your love. Lord Jesus, we now simply lift our hearts up to you. Take them and cleanse them, Lord God. Make us into ever more beautiful, ever more true, ever more righteous servants of you. Father, we take a moment of silence to pray for all those who are lost, that they might come into salvation. Holy Spirit, please come. In your name do we pray. Amen.